Welcome to Reimagining Healthcare, a new dialogue with risk and patient safety leaders presented by MedPlace. We're excited to bring you conversations with top risk and patient safety thought leaders from organizations around the country. Please subscribe to get the latest news and content. And if you value uh, this episode, please feel free to share it with your colleagues. We're trying to create meaningful dialogues in other communities around the country. If you're interested in participating as a guest, please send us an email at speakers at medplace.com. My name is Jared Bailey. I'm the CEO of MedPlace. I'm going to play host today. And today I'm joined by Candace Eden. Hi, Candace. Good afternoon. So, Candace, I have here that you are a Joint Commission consultant and past president of the Florida Society for Healthcare Risk Management. Yes. Uh, and, and obviously, or if it's not obvious, the opinions that you're going to share today are yours and not the Joint Commission's. Uh, so welcome. Right. Thank you. So happy so to be here. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining me. I'm super interested in this conversation. Um, it, it's top of mind. We, we do a lot of work with uh, hospitals and clinics and all sorts of uh, folks in between around the country. And the Joint Commission's always coming up, right? Right. Um, before I jump into that, I'm going to give a little bit of a bio. I have a bio of yours here. You tell me if we get this all right. So Candace is a seasoned DNP executive with 40 years of nursing experience and over 28 years of leadership and quality improvement experience. She currently serves as a consultant of the Joint Commission, where she helps organizations across the country interested in evaluating their current processes and workflows to aid in continuous improvement and Joint Commission survey readiness. Exactly, yes. I love it. <laughs> uh, I think I need your help. <clears throat> in more than a few places, but uh, in your advice, certainly. Um, and by the way, I'll put your your LinkedIn and uh, your contact information in the show notes afterwards. But uh, but this is great. So so tell me a, a little bit about your backstory, right? How did you go from bedside care to joint commission? What that would that path look like? Oh, well, that, that's a good question. So um, long ago, I can remember my, my very first job, Jared, I was making $6.35 an hour as an RN at a major trauma center in Miami, and I was so thrilled. So you can see that's been a while ago. But um, clinically, I mostly did um, open heart surgery, cardiology, and then fell in love with emergency nursing. It's that adrenaline, and you never know what's going to come in the door in the next minute. So I just loved that and problem solving. So then as I, as I went through my career, you know, I was in leadership a few times, did some management roles, et cetera, and I decided I needed to vary my experience. So I worked at a trauma center a community hospital. I worked for ambulatory clinics for a while. Then I did an industry, like an external partner that was doing patient experience and um, got to open a, a pediatric hospital here in Orlando. So no um, wow. intentionally, yeah, intentionally chose those things. So I wanted to be marketable, right? And uh, along with that, my academic career grew. So I started with an associate's degree in nursing, got my bachelor's, got my master's. And then I guess I just kept going and got my doctorate. So um, I felt like as I you know, aged in the profession, I would have more to offer with those two combined. And it worked out. You know, Now um, the last 20 years have been the quality risk patient safety. I just love it. Being able to keep patients safe, being able to mentor young nurses, it's just a thrill for me. So it's been good. Fantastic. And and so where where did where does then the, the joint commission come in? Where did that intersection start? So last year, um, looking for what exactly did I want to do next in my life? And, and it was getting to um, a point where that mentorship was great at the organization I was at, because I was at a corporate um, level organization, that was fine. But I think I just wanted to be able to spread that more. And I have a very good friend who's a joint commission surveyor, and she just said, you ought to look into the consulting arm and see what you could do, because you could bring your experience to that. So I interviewed and they said, yes. Yeah. So um, we both said yes to the dress and, and here I am. So really love it. Fantastic. Well, and you've seen so many different parts of healthcare, and you've been in so many different settings. It's got to give you a particularly helpful perspective, right? And I don't know if you're working with any particular type or size of organizations today. Is there 
there any sort of like specific purview that you've got or? So um, it's really all different. So it just so happens, I do the Joint Commission mock surveys. That's getting them ready, right, as they are going to be surveyed. And it could be in a hospital. It could be in a laboratory. It could be in an ambulatory care setting or a surgery center or even home care. So they do all of those. And then I started doing CMS consults as well. So again, these are mock consults for if CMS comes. And a lot of hospitals will have CMS come look after they've had their Joint Commission survey. So it's a little different perspective, more regulatory, um, but we help them prepare. And then the last thing is I started doing certification. So if you want to be an acute care hospital and mark, uh, for cardiac surgery and market that, or you want to be an advanced hip and knee center, um, I can also go out and, and help you get ready for that certification. So all of those things. Boy, that's a lot. Good thing you've uh, you've probably seen a lot of those, uh, oh, yeah. those things throughout your career. So you know it's interesting. We're we're in this risk and patient safety world, and, and a lot of our audience is you know there's a lot of folks who are in hospitals, right, and they're doing that type of work in hospitals. A lot of our audience is sitting at carriers that are dealing with risk much further downstream, right? So it's after you know bad things have happened, and right. lawsuits and things like that. And, and so I do a lot of work, I interact with a lot with claims people and attorneys and law firms and things like that. And it's it's sometimes shocking to me how, how little a lot of folks in that world know about what's happening at the, in the hospital setting from a risk and a patient safety perspective, right? Um, right? Just things like concepts like peer review, a lot of them have heard of it, but they don't really know how it functions, right? And they don't know the, the, the things and the bad things and the the dysfunctional things about it and things like that. So, um, and very often, I, I think they just have sort of an academic view of what Joint Commission even does in the process. Right. Um, so for those of those of the audience that really don't understand the Joint Commission in detail, can you explain it just a little bit, kind of fly over, and there's kind of two, two parts of the business, right? The consulting part and sort of the traditional part of Joint Commission, I guess. Sure, happy to. So um, Joint Commission is deemed by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid to go to an, um, facilities, whether it be that ambulatory center or hospital or physician office even, and either accredit them or certify them um, in the care that they deliver. So it's to make sure that everything in place for patient and employee safety actually is, is being done. And it's really a, a check and balance. So Joint Commission is the survey side and there's a very definitive firewall for those who don't know between that side and what I do for consulting. So we are not allowed to know what findings Joint Commission had for an organization we go to unless they tell us, right, personally. We cannot uh, say where we're going so the Joint Commission knows what we've looked at. But what's exciting is, uh, as you use consultants, we go out, you can tell us all the things that are happening that you're concerned about, all your dirty linen, if you will. You want us to find it so we can help you get ready and really shine when Joint Commission comes and does your actual survey. And, and you want us to catch that because you know, everybody wants to do well and everybody wants to be considered safe. And, and I will say, Jared, that for the consumer today, you need to be able to demonstrate that you are keeping patients safe so that when they come to you, they feel safe, right? After COVID, people were worried about even going to a hospital and many didn't get care and it was delayed. So we want people to come back come get your care, we'll take care of you, and we'll do it in the best and safest way possible. So that's really where Joint Commission, I think, shines. That's great. Now, I've heard that the Joint Commission has an actual goal, right? You hear the, uh, this goal of zero harm events. Um, that's that's fantastic. Obviously, it's a it's a goal that we, we all want to aspire to and, and actually achieving it is, it's, you know, a whole other animal, right? But, uh, and there's going to be certain parts of healthcare that are, are going to be better set up to, to get to that goal than others. Like, where's the longest road ahead uh, that you see, or like, you know, as far as what areas of healthcare are really, uh, you know, either uh, have the longest road? Well, well, yeah, who has the hardest job in front of them? Right. Uh, zero harm is truly the ideal to go after, right? And there's controversy even about that. Can we get there? Is that, a, is that an attainable goal? And 
Yeah, I've seen it in different segments in small amounts, especially in infection prevention. But I will tell you, those are, those are, that's one of the areas that is the longest to get to. So especially after COVID, we saw an increase in hospital card infections across the country. So everyone is looking to prevent those line infections, you know, Foley catheter infections after surgical infections. I still think we've got a lot of work to do there. Um, also, I think uh, another um, big area for us to look at is that miscommunication or um, non-communication, if you will, in things like handoff. So if you're coming in through the emergency department and then you go up to a floor, does that information get translated to the right people? Does it get to the physicians that the nurses have heard? And just we're seeing a lot of error come out of that miscommunication or missed information. So it's really paying attention to that detail and making sure that those things get passed on. I think those are the two biggest areas that we've got a long way to go. And, and I'll tell you another area that we're seeing a lot recently is, and there's a huge focus from Joint Commission perspective on environment of care. So are you keeping your facility up to snuff? Are the employees that are using the equipment really using it by the manufacturer's instructions? Or have they gotten complacent with how they do it? They learned it from one person a certain way and maybe that wasn't the right way. So we're really finding a lot of things in the upkeep of the facility and the safety of that facility. So, so there's a big emphasis on that too. That's fascinating. You know, just, just uh, you, you mentioned a second ago, the handoff part of the process and how critical that is. There's uh, I, I did an interview with uh, the founder of a company called iPass. Uh, oh, yes. Six weeks ago. Do you know about them? Yeah. I do and very well. The stats that they're putting out as far as like how to just take error out of the process by focusing on that handoff and facilitating cleaner and, and more rich handoffs is just really, really fascinating. Yeah. And we'll, we'll talk about peer review again because there's a lot of ways that you can prevent that error from doing excellent peer review, right? So. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. Definitely well, we'll definitely, yeah. definitely get into that. Um, any other, uh, what are the big obstacles? Like what, what's keeping um, quality improvement from moving forward right now? Is it the, just those things you just mentioned or are there, because it feels to me like there's maybe there's some cultural issues in certain uh, settings and, and there's other things that are kind of holding back. Yeah, holding definitely the, cultural the quality issues. Back. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yes, Jared, definitely cultural issues. And we'll even talk about that a little bit more, developing that culture of safety. And that really is the accountability of leadership. And I'm, I'm talking all the way to the board. It, they must be engaged. Um, but two, some of the other obstacles are, first of all, patients don't really know what is good quality versus what is poor quality. And I think sometimes they just accept poor quality when they don't need to. Like, for example, if you don't speak the language, if Spanish, for example, is your primary language, we need to make sure that we are providing all healthcare information in the language you best understand, right? And not yeah. just using your, your five-year-old or your 10-year-old child to translate that for you. So I'm, I'm seeing that a lot across the country, country also, and organizations are stepping up to make sure they have those translation services available. But that, that's important that you can, as a patient, yeah. speak up and say, I don't understand, or, or could you explain more? So they make good decisions. And also it, quality and safety is not necessarily a moneymaker, right? And we're seeing hospitals all over the country, you see in Becker's and other reports, they're losing $1.5 billion, Kaiser's losing money, Cleveland Clinic, is, everyone is talking about it. So we're gonna have to think about how do we um, work together to make sure the community gets the services they need and maybe not have those redundant services in other facilities in our community. I mean, we're gonna to have to think about that. I know that's controversial, but yeah, I think- but you know, think about it's, it. it's an interesting topic because when you look at the, the business of, of risk, there's, it's funny how many hospitals have this firewall between risk right. and patient safety, right? And, uh, and so what's happening on the patient safety side is there's, there's all this good stuff happening. And then underneath all the good stuff are all of these, um, uh, uh, you know, sort of bad uh, habits and and uh, a procedure that's just sort of been done wrong from the beginning and, it's, and it just keeps getting done wrong. And there's like hidden underneath uh, all of the great things that we're doing every day in a hospital setting are the things that we're going to get sued for five years from now. 
Yes. Right? And it's it's happening and it has a dollar amount to it, everything from decubitus ulcers, which are common to lots of lots of other things. They're happening right now, but they're not being um, exposed, elevated, uh, or seen or identified. And so they end up becoming a problem later, and those problems later have real dollars associated with them. And there's some people in the risk world that are really good at thinking about risk from a business perspective and making sure that that you know, these programs are being articulated in a dollars and cents perspective. And a lot of a lot of nurses didn't come up in in business school. And, and you know, there's this there's this friction between the the C-suite and in and, and those that are actually providing clinical care. Um, but, you know, I think of like uh, like a Pamela Poppet, Gallagher Bassett. She's really good. at. She was a former president of Ashram. Uh, she's really, really good at identifying the business um, Ace behind the 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 quality and, and safety systems that should be implemented, right? Because she sees it on the on the other end in form of lawsuits and claims and things like that. So I think I, it's kind of a dream for next year. I want to do I want to get some folks like Pamela and some others to just do a tour of like how to build business cases around patient safety measures uh, because I think that's a missing piece. That there's a lot of power behind that. I, I agree completely. That, that's really important what you're saying, Jared, because first of all, patient safety was always kind of behind the scenes, risk management even more behind the scenes, right? And it was intentional that we kept things quiet. You know, attorneys were afraid that if we disclosed errors were happening, that patients wouldn't come to us. But it's completely the opposite. So we talked briefly about the culture of safety, so we'll expand on a little bit more. It's being transparent. That's what we're looking for today. Um, I worked with a, a risk manager locally here in Orlando who's excellent, excellent, a director of risk. And we worked together from a patient safety and risk perspective when I was in that role to um, have communication with the leaders from all of those facilities that we worked with to disclose errors. So we shared them and it was like revolutionary to these leaders. They had never heard what each individual hospital had done and what they did to make it from happening again. But that prevents it everywhere. And then we we took a series, we uh, created a series called it, ha it Could Happen to You. And it happened to me. And it was a physician, then we had a nurse, then we had others, and they would tell their story of maybe leaving a sponge in a patient after surgery. It happened to me and it could happen to you. And what could we do to make that not happen again? And we then sent those videos out to all the staff. And it got such great feedback because transparency is key. You've got to be open and talking to your patients, talking to your consumers, your families, and your staff. So they'll speak up, right? We want them comfortable. After Rhonda yeah, Devon, we, we have to do something to make sure nurses will tell us when something goes awry. Oh, I know, right? Gosh, the stuff that nurses are having to consider now. I yeah. mean, who would have thought we'd be here, right, from a year ago? Um, so yeah, you know, I think there's a there's a lot of power in um, uh, when uh, providers, when when nurses and doctors and specialists, when they uh, collaborate with each other, in in a I see the silos, and silos are are very much uh, either in departments or or they're at least siloed within an organization. And we'll you know, it's very often I'll meet like a you know a hospital system that's in one part of the country. And they just sort of do the things that they know to do, right? And they continue to do that. And maybe they have some new doctors come in and they bring a little bit of new blood. But I, I honestly think one of the revolutions of healthcare in the next, you know, two to five years is going to be the dismantling of those silos and creating more opportunities for uh, collaboration, right? We're doing it. I, I, I can take an operating, uh, you know, clinician uh, in Mayo Clinic and, and where they normally would be geographically bound their influence is geographically bound to scottsdale all of a sudden now they can influence you know hospitals on the other side of the of the country right and you start creating or getting rid of the friction in between the talent and the experience and i think we're going to see a big revolution as far as uh quality patient safety the velocity of learning um the velocity of of you know um implementing new procedures and things like that. I think it's going to be awesome. I, you know, we're back to your business case discussion um, in Pam. And yes, absolutely. We need to make that business case that that collaboration is key and that we're joining. So for example, um, 
you had mentioned earlier, I was president of Fishrooms last year, which is that Florida State Organization of Risk and Patient Safety. And um, we work very closely with our state organization, which is called ACA. And uh, they come and present at our conference, our annual conference. We collaborate and present together. So we are trying to establish that collaborative relationship, if you will, with other agencies that we're working with. Also with Florida Nurse Association and the Florida Hospital Association. And now we're branching out um, with some of our educational offerings in the Southeast. So we're looking to involve Georgia and Alabama and North and South Carolina and you know have that same kind of consistent education. All, it's all about collaboration though, Jared. It's all about that business yeah. case. It's all about us all joining forces and, and making improvements. Well, Candace, so what do we do about the lawyers? <laughs> we can't do without the lawyers, so we have to have them and they're great advisors, right? They are. I we need can't. to bring them along with us. I think we just need to include them in those conversations. And just like we've learned to be transparent in hospitals where we were afraid, we just got to bring them along and say, look, there's no need to be fearful of this. This is how we reduce the money you're going to have to pay out, right? Because yep, we're going right. to make that business case, look at these things and prevent it from happening. So, you know, the, there's and the more, frankly, the more we collaborate through um, initiatives like Candelo and, and rehab data yes. collaboration flowing, the, the more we can learn faster than just what's happening under our roof. And we can make decisions that are based on like sort of industry macro trends and things like that. And, and so, yeah, I think the more of that that we see, the more data that goes into systems like Candelo, the more that can come out and make, again, better decisions. Right, and, and we're hearing too, Jared, all over that there are different um, industries that are looking to come in and manage the emergency department, for example, or imagine, you know, re, um, manage practices for physicians and stuff. So there's there's a lot of people that are creeping into our business. So we need to make sure that we, you know, have a, a voice in that. That's great. You know, conversation is the